So we're going to take off from where uh, we we were ended the, the previous session. And we were going to talk about discrete events, you know, what they are and how they are useful in the models, and then also show how they happen in Copasi and virtual cell. Uh, and then if we have time, we'll talk a little bit about scripting languages and running things in the cloud. If not, then we we will try to uh, rearrange some more, some more time, perhaps tomorrow or, or um, yeah, perhaps tomorrow. Anyway, so both Copaz and Virtual Cell are able to um, represent discrete events. That's actually discrete events were defined in the SVML language, which I think um, Michael will talk about later, um, but it's the common file format that both Copaz and VCL read, as you, can, as you saw from our previous speaker that other packages can also read and, and manipulate and use. Um, so discrete events are basically uh, events, things that happen at a dis at a, an instant in time, at a, absolutely instantaneously. So they are not defined by ODEs. It's almost like the ODEs stop at that moment, something happens, and then the ODEs continue after that. Um, and as I said, both, has, both Copasi and Vcell have events. Um, events have three major um, concepts. One is when they happen, and then what they they do, what variables or parameters they modify. And finally, the events may have an optional delay. Um, so the trigger, the when when the event is triggered may not be the same time as when the, the, the actual happening things happen. So there could be a delay between the two. So in Copasi, uh, delays, uh, events are, are defined in the model. There's a, a tab for events. And these are the things that you can define in events. Um, basically, you give, it, you give them a name. Uh, they have an expression, which is a logical expression that tells you when the event happens. Then uh, another section, they have a list of things that get affected by the event. So this is one thing, in this case, map KPP, it's a variable. So it's a species concentration. So what happens to it? Um, well, which species have something happening to it? And then here it's what that species is set to. In this case, it's set to just a number, but it could be a, an expression. It could be a value of another species. It could be a complicated function. So in this case, you read this, uh, the event is written down here, the translation that says at time 500, we set the map KK PP concentration to 200. And that's a that's a discrete event. This could be, for example, the intervention of a of an in an experiment. Um, but as you will see, there's other things that events can do, not necessarily just changing the model. The event might also not change the model. Now in vCell, and uh, there will be a demonstration after this. Um, um, Jan will show it in more detail. But in vCell, you do this in the protocols, and there is a tab for events on the protocols, and it's similar to to Copasi. Um, here you define when to apply. So that's on condition T bigger than 500. Uh, here is what is changed, the map KK, map KPP, and then the new value is over there. So essentially you have also exactly the same things you have to define on both of them. They're just, of course, different interfaces. They happen in different places. By the way, if you save this file and re read it in Copasi, you could then read those same uh, exact parameters in, in this setting. It would be the same thing. So this is what would happen in Copasi. That's exactly that event on, the, on a certain model. So as you can see, um, at time 500, we change the concentration of map KPP to 200. So whatever it value it had, it went to 200. So in this case, it was a decrease, but if it was down here, it would go up. So that was a fixed clumping. Imagine some experiment could do that. So how so a little looking at this into a little bit more detail, how do we define a an event? So an event is defined by a, a logical expression. It's an expression that has a value of true or false. And the event happens when the logical value of this expression changes from false to true. It it happens at the exact moment when it changes from false to true. But it doesn't happen when it changes from true to false only when it goes from false to true. Um, so for example, you cannot think something like time bigger than 400. So at exactly 400 units of time plus one infinitesimal 
tiny little bit that this becomes true. And it never becomes true again, because at that point it's true and it will continue true until the end, right? Because time never goes back. Um, we can also define it, say that concentration of A is bigger than concentration of B. Uh, and this may happen also at one point in time, but if you think about, for example, the simulation I showed earlier of the foxes and the rabbits, which go up and down, if this is foxes larger than rabbits, then that happens several times if it's oscillating. So the events may happen many times, right? So it happens when A was lower than lower than B and then suddenly becomes bigger at that point. And then if there was an oscillation and then it again becomes lower and then at the moment that it becomes larger, it's again triggered. And you can add things like a, a function. So for example, you can add a sinusoid, um, a variable that basically is, is changing um, with the sine uh, with the sine function, uh, you can have that that the rate of that is bigger than zero, and this also happens at uh, several points in time because, of course, it's a sinusoid; it goes up and down um, like this, right? So that function changes like that, and if we say uh, the event happens when that rate is bigger than zero, so it happens here, it happens there again, it happens there again, and this would be one way to code how to make an event happen at certain um, regular time points. There are other ways as well to do that. So then the next thing is what is changed. So those are the targets. The targets can be normally any entity of the model. They can be a parameter, they can be a variable. Um, so if you change a parameter, of course the model will change and it will change the nature of the model. So if you change a rate constant, that means that suddenly somehow you made something happen faster or slower. Uh, how that would relate to reality depends on your model, and I'm not going to discuss that, but changing a parameter really changes the model. Whereas changing a variable only changes the state of the system. It's like when you suddenly add more rabbits to the to the Lotka Volterra model, and uh, now you know there was a perturbation in the system at that moment. There, but after that, the model continues with the same rates that it that it same rate constants that it had. Um, so Changing the variables uh, uh, themselves means that only the state of the model changes. And then that means that you can define variables of your model that if they don't interact with anything else, let's say they are in Copasi, you create them as global quantities and you can create them just to remember some values. So these work exactly like probes in an experiment, something that you add that is there to reveal a measurement of some value to you. And, and in this case, you just create a variable that will remember some value, for example, the, the height of a peak or something of that kind. So those can be used as, me as measurements. And then the new value, as I said, can be an algebraic expression. So it could be in any calculation uh, or it could be just a number perhaps. Sometimes that, that's enough. Uh, or it could be a parameter that is changed somewhere else as well. So these are types of events. For example, uh, these events would be defining time-dependent perturbation. So for example, in an experiment, you can add an aliquot of an inhibitor at a certain amount, certain point in time. So the, the event would change the concentration of the inhibitors. This is, your event is the same as the pipette coming into your test tube. Uh, or change the rate of entry of a substrate. So this would be changing a rate constant. And for example, this would allow you to enable a reaction or disable a reaction. You can set the rate constant to zero and that means the reaction is now stopped. Let's say that you added some inhibitor that completely blocked something, then you could do that by changing a reaction rate to zero. Uh, the second type of examples is when the event is part of the model. And some there are some models where events are um, inherent um, parts of the model. For example, uh, I'm thinking of a model of, a of the yeast cell cycle, a famous model from John Tyson's group and, and Belanovac. This is from this paper in 2004, which is also in biomodels. Uh, there, the events happen as the model passes from certain um, checkpoints on the cell cycle. And those events change certain things. Um, so that in that in that case, the event is an inherent part of the model. So it's part of the of the mechanics of of what is happening. And then the final example is what I mentioned earlier, which is to use an event as a as a way of measuring something. 
So you can ask, for example, three different questions here that could be carried out with events, find a time at which a variable exceeds a certain threshold. So you define the, th the condition is exceeding the threshold, and then you have a variable that just stores that time. So then you know when it happened. When that, for example, for the previous talk, when he said um, there was one of the variables was how long does the uh, compound stay up in the therapeutic range? So that could be done with two events, one to find the time when it is above and then another one to find the time when it is below. So then you could measure the, how long it was, it took that the uh, compound was actually pharmacologically active. Uh, you can measure the period of an oscillation by measuring when uh, measuring a peaks and then when was the previous peak. Uh, you can measure the amplitude as well. So you you measure the high the high point, you measure the low point, and and then you find out what is um, the difference between them. In fact, the amplitude would be half of that. So those are all things you can do with events. Um, so I'm not going to show an example. I'm just going to go um, and and um, pass it on to. Um, Jon, who is going to show us something in virtual cell. Jon. Okay, Jon Moraro seems to not be in. Yeah, I can. So I will, if that's the case, then I'm going to move to the next topic. And then... Jan can then do um, uh, the demonstration. I think that's probably the best way. If you can get in touch with him, I think he probably fell off the internet because he's from home. Yeah, I'm texting him now. Okay. Um, so the other topic that we were going to talk about now was also scripting and running uh, simulations on the cloud. So. I'm going to talk about Copasi, particularly here. Um, Jan can then, when he comes back, he can talk about virtual cell. So Copasi has a number of ways in which it can be used um, where, where we can have scripts um, commanding Copasi. Well, the simple version is that, uh, simple thing is that Copasi can be run from the command line. Um, you may not have noticed, but when you installed Copasi, the normal Copasi you run is the graphical user interface. But in the same folder where Copasi was installed, also another executable called Copasi SE for simulation engine is also installed and that can be run from a command line. And that basically runs by calling it with the file being the Copasi file that's going to be run as an argument. So you have to have built the Copasi file independently. And then you can give it certain, uh, a number of options. These are actually, there's a, a number of options more than this slide. I'm afraid this slide is a little old. Um, but you can do several things. Uh, so not just what the command line says, but the file itself has encoded which simulations are running. And just to give you an example, um, this is the reason why the various tasks in Copasi have this tick here that says executable. This actually makes no has no interest in the front end it only exists there just so you can save a Copasi file that says execute this task and execute this task. So the tasks that are marked, marked as executable, when you call the command line version, they are run. So if you mark time course as an executable, that's what's going to get run. If you mark time course and parameter scan, then both the time course happens and then the parameter scan as well. So you can mark one task or all the tasks, they happen in sequence. Um, if you mark them all. But usually you normally have only one task uh, marked as executable. So that's one way in which you could script. You could use, you could do some um, scripts that change the Copasi file and then you can run them on the command line. And you could do this on a server, for example. And by the way, the outcome is just the reports. There's no plots created. You have to create reports in Copasi. Those are files that get results written in. That's the only way in which you can run. And in fact, the command line version, if it reads a Copasi file that does not have any reports encoded, it will actually not run anything. It will just tell you, you don't have any outputs. There's no point in me wasting time running a simulation because you, you have no way of knowing where I did or not. So, so that's one 
one way, but this is very primitive. And the major problem why this is primitive is because um, you would have to, your script would have to change a COPASI file. And this is what a COPASI file looks like. It's uh, a bit of XML and it's complicated to figure out how to edit these files using your own tools. So, I mean, it can be done, but it is very cumbersome. So there are better ways of doing this than the command line version. Um, how else can you script Kopasi? Well, there are some programming, um, there are some ways of adapting pro programming languages to Kopasi. For a long time, we had this uh, low level API, which basically it's a C++ API that exposes the internals of Kopasi to your own program. So using C++ or other languages such as Python, Java, R, you could then interact with the internals of Kopasi. But that is very low level. So you to do this, even though it's possible, and there are a number of packages that do that, including virtual cell, that's how virtual cell uses Kopasi to do parameter estimation. Uh, other cells like cell designer, Pico tools, SB pipe, these all use this low level um, API. However, to develop a program that uses the low level API, you have to learn a lot of how Kopasi works internally, which is very tedious very, very uh, time consuming. There's many, many, many classes. I mean, it's quite complicated. So this is not very accessible to most people. So in order to make this accessible to many more um, um, potential users, uh, Jürgen Pali and Frank Bergman, who are both here in the audience, have created two high level um, APIs for Kupazi. And I'll, in a moment, I'll, I'll mention what high level means. Um, so one is for the R programming language, and that's called Cork, as in um, the, um, well, I forgot what Cork stands for, Jürgen. It's the Kopasi. Okay, Jürgen is. Um, Kopasi R connector. Kopasi R connector, yeah, thanks, Stefan. Um, so it's the Kopasi R connector. This is a package for the R programming language, and I can show it to you. Um, so if you follow that link, uh, it's a page on GitHub. You have Cork here. In fact, the name was here. I could have come to this page immediately. It tells you how you can install it in, in R, and it gives you some examples of how you would use Kopasi in R. And if you come to examples, there's even... Um, more examples showing you, for example, how to calculate a 3D trajectory plot of a calcium model and things like that. In fact, because R has this um, shiny interface, you can actually manipulate the web page like that. So that's quite neat. So you have some examples here of, of the language, but essentially using Cork, you write an R program and it's more or less, um, you, you, you run, uh, um, a time course, basically by using this run time course um, method. And what you get is basically a, a, a data frame, which you can then manipulate just like other data frames in R. The other one is called Basico or Basico, um, which was developed by Frank Bergman, and that's a, a, also a high level API for Python. And again, you can go to the web. Uh, Basico is on, on GitHub um, as well. You can go to this page. And uh, again, you have in, uh, instructions how to install it, what, the, what else you need installed to run it. And then it has a number of um, um, examples as well. It has a full manual in read the docs. So you can see everything, what you, how you can use it as example files. It's also fairly easy to do. So essentially, it's the same um, spirit as as um, as with uh, Cork, which is you create a data frame. The results of you run a Kopasi method, and you get back the results in a data frame, and then you can use whatever you want in Python to manipulate that data frame. Um, so I was just going to try and uh, see if so loading a model is uh, very simple or running a time course. Again, it's the same thing, TC equals run time course and the duration. And then this TC is a data frame that you can then use. Um, I think this is maybe matplotlib that is being used to then plot the, um, 
the time course. Uh, you can change the duration, do another plot. You can get, uh, there's basically methods for manipulating almost everything, but they're fairly high level. With a low level API, you would have to be setting really a large number of primitive operations that together form what these uh, operations are like run a steady state or run time course. So this is uh, quite useful. I know there are people here in the pro in some of the projects are using, uh, I think, uh, basic, I'm not sure about Cork. Um, but those are uh, methods to program and interface Copasi directly into programming. And by the way, you can then, both with Cork or Basico, you can write Jupyter notebooks uh, using this. And again, I know some people are doing that. Maybe we will see in the symposium. Okay, let me check in now to see if um, Jan is um, available already. Did you manage to contact him, Michael? You're muted. I texted him, but didn't see any response so far. Okay. Well, um, this is kind of what I had. Um, well, no, I have still the cloud cloud Copasi. So that, let me talk about the other one. Again, this is only for Copasi. Uh, virtual cell actually run can run on the cloud, as you can see. If you're using virtual cell, you have two run buttons. One runs locally on your computer. The other one runs on the servers here at Yukon Health. And so running um, virtual cell in the cloud is really very easy because the interface allows you to do that straight away. In Copasi, that's not the case. Uh, Copasi gets installed on your computer and it runs on, a, on your computer. Um, and in fact, if... Uh, there is a development currently current development going on of writing Copasi as JavaScript. If that happens, you can even run it on your phone if you want to. Not that uh, it would be the best use of your, of your phone, but perhaps. Um, however, Copasi normally just runs on the system where it's installed. So what we have done is to create a package called Cloud Copasi that can be installed on the server. It's a front end, and it can be connected to a um, HPC facility or uh, a cluster, a computer cluster. And this allows you to submit some specific types of uh, simulations that then can be accelerated by running them in parallel. So the types of things that can be run in parallel are actually, um, for example, stochastic simulations where normally you want to run a large number of them and to determine the distribution of the time courses. So that you can do. So in this case, this page is showing you, we're going to, we upload the model, but this was that Lotka Volterra model we had. Uh, and then you say, well, I want a million of these. Um, and then you will get, eventually you'll get the return with the 1 million time courses. And from there, in fact, uh, the, this package will also determine the mean and standard deviation at each, at each time point as well. So you can already figure out the distribution. Um, out of the large number of simulations. The other things it, it does is, for example, running several parameter estimations at the same time, because often you want to run more than once because the algorithms are stochastic. Um, parameter scan as well, it's another task that can be split into different numbers of... of so if you have a, a, a parameter scan that has 10 uh, values then you can actually run it on 10 machines. So it'll run approximately 10 times as fast. There's some overhead, of course, submitting files and come getting them back from the cluster, et cetera. Uh, so how do you use Cloud Copasi? So we have a, currently a, um, it is still an experimental server, which is at cloud-copasi dot com uchc.edu I will I can uh, give you that um, address later on you can sign in and and uh, create an account here if you do this is going to run on on whatever you upload to to this cloud Copasi runs on the servers here at Yukon Health um, I'm just going to um, sign in and show you from my account some some of the things that you could do um, And you can run a number of tasks. The tasks that you can run are basically 
uh, Yon is here already, so I'll, I'll just I'm just finishing. They're basically repeating optimization runs, scanning parallel, repeating parameter estimation, tracing profile likelihoods of of um, parameter estimations, optimizing uh, sensitivities. That is finding a minimum and maximum of sensitivity values across very large ranges or repeating stochastic simulation. So those are the things that one could do. And basically you just upload a file and then um, select how many um, how many um, runs you have to do how, in how many chunks you want to split your file. So I'm going to stop here and let Jon take over. Is Jan available already? Yes, I am. <clears throat> Sorry about that, Pedro. You said 145. Oh, no, uh, 145, I have to go. Ah, OK. I thought 145 is starting. Yep. Um, I don't know. So in fact, I have to go now. But because I, I am recording, I'm going to do is stop recording. And then, um, Michael, can you start yourself? Yeah, I, I can start recording. Okay, I've got to stop recording if I can find it. Yeah, there he goes. <laughs>